much for the warm welcome. I'm really excited to be here. So as Gleb said, today I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction into scanning electron microscopy or SEM for life sciences. All right. So the talk is really meant for people who might be a little bit new to SEM and maybe they're curious to find out more. So you don't need to have a background in SEM to understand the talk today. I'd really love for you to come away with an understanding of how the SEM works, what it can be used for, and a knowledge of how it's relevant for life science applications. And I really hope at the end of this talk, you have an inspiration to find out even more and maybe how it can benefit your own research. So if you're interested in getting a little bit more information or maybe even hearing about X-ray microscopy or volume SEM imaging and sample preparation, I highly recommend that you check out our website that we've created for this talk series. And you can do so by clicking or taking an image of the QR code with your smartphone. Um, and we'll also put a link to that website into the chat box. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump right on into it. So we are going to just go through a quick overview of SEM and life sciences. What is it? What does it look like? What, app, what kind of applications can benefit from SEM? Then we'll go through the basic operating principles of the SEM. How does it work? We'll go through some of the main components of an SEM. And then we'll talk about beam specimen interaction, one of my favorite subjects. So how the electron beam interacts with the life science sample to produce these really cool images. And then we'll go into some signal detection. So taking the signals that are created by that beam specimen interaction and creating these beautiful images. Um, then we'll do a brief summary. So we're going to go ahead and dive right on in with an overview of the SEM for life science. So the SEM is a really powerful tool that uses high energy electrons instead of visible light. And in doing so, we are methodically scanning the surface of a specimen to form a really magnified high resolution image. And so magnification, you know, seeing that blown up view of the sample, this is a really vital part of any type of microscopy. But resolution is equally important. So resolution for anyone who might not be aware is that smallest distance at which two points can be seen as two separate and distinct entities. So because the SEM relies on electrons to form the image as opposed, excuse me, as opposed to light rays, light rays which have much longer wavelengths, the resolving power of the electron microscope is about 100 times greater than the standard light microscope. So what does that mean? That means that we are able to resolve very, very fine details of your specimen. So we can see um, images on or details on that specimen that are as little as 0.3 to one nanometers apart. That's really, really tiny and really opens up a whole new world of microscopy and of life science organisms being able to see in that much detail. Uh, we can also magnify a sample up to a million times. So again, speaking to that just whole new world that we're able to open up. So this level of high spatial resolution also enables segmentation of ultrastructural information. So getting details of life science specimens down to that ultrastructural detail of the cell. So I know before I was really kind of got into that world of electron microscopy, when I thought of an SEM, I thought of that, you know, that classic topographical image. So kind of like what you're seeing here. This is a forget-me-not flower and little grains of pollen on it. So you're seeing almost this 3D-like image of that specimen. But over the years, SEM has actually really evolved in such a way that we can actually look at these ultra-structural 2D images of the sample and see them in, in these really, really fine details, almost this TEM-like image with the SEM. So we'll talk a little bit more throughout the talk about what that means and how we're able to do that with the SEM. So really many biological applications can benefit from this level of detail. I mean, you name it, we can probably get some type of amazing data for that type of application, whether that be neuroscience or plant science, cell or cancer biology, uh, forensics, drug discovery, you name it. There's just a really wide array of applications that we can cover. 
So I just want to touch on some of the versatile techniques that we're able to accomplish with scanning electron microscopy. Um, and one of those is topography. So using that high resolution in order to gain details of that really fine surface structure. So this is an image um, actually of an octopus. So seeing those tiny little tentacles and the suckers in that high level of detail. We're also able to combine the data that we can get with a scanning electron microscope with data that you can get from other types of microscopy, such as laser scanning microscopy or confocal. And we call that correlative light in electron microscopy or CLEM. So you're connecting that structural information with now functional information. And that level of detail is extremely powerful. Uh, we can also connect other types of microscopy, like using X-ray microscopes and connecting that with volume electron microscopy studies to see where you are in the sample. Um, another type of imaging we're able to accomplish with CSCM is cryoimaging. So investigating samples in this frozen state actually allows us to see that sample in its near to native state. So what does that mean? We're able to see that sample as naturally as we possibly can. So typically when we are looking at samples with the scanning electron microscope, those samples need to be prepared in a really specific way to be able to withstand the high vacuum environment of the SEM and be bombarded with electrons. So we, we protect the sample in a way by chemically fixing it. So by chemically fixing it, we're also preserving it in time so that we can see that sample before it starts to degrade and decay. But in doing so, we slightly alter the physical makeup of that sample. So by using frozen imaging, we can actually get rid of the chemical fixation and see that sample as naturally as possible. So in that near to native state. So we're also able to use the SCM to delve into more of this 3D structural information. And this is a really powerful technique that we can do in a variety of ways. And one of those is with array tomography. So with this, we're able to analyze the ultrastructure of thinly sliced biological material that we place either on a grid, like a TEM grid or a wafer like you see here, um, or a cover slip. And then we can image it with the SEM or with the STEM. And we take those 2D data slices and then create these 3D data stacks. And then we can segment that data into the information that you see here with array tomography. Um, another thing that we're able to do um, in the vein of volume SEM is serial block face SEM or um, SBF. So this is direct imaging of a sample block that's been resin embedded. So we take a biological sample, um, we embed it in some type of epoxy or plastic, we put it into the SEM that has an in situ ultramicrotome. So that ultramicrotome is gonna take really thin slices of that sample, and then the scanning electron beam is gonna come in, scan the surface and give us an image. And then we'll cut away the top, scan the surface and get an image. And we do that over and over and over and create this volume data. So this really kind of, kind of saves time and um, saves you from that time it takes to actually use the ultramicrotome and collect all of those sections. Another thing that we're able to do is called focused ion beam SEM or FibSEM. So here we can use a resin embedded or a vitrified or a frozen sample and actually take three nanometer slices, so very, very fine resolution. Um, instead of using an ultramicrotome knife, we're actually using an ion beam. So it's gonna ablate away that top surface and then image it. And we're actually able to image as we go. So this really speaks to the automation of this technology. Um, we're also able to create lamella. And so lamella are these areas where we can um, thin out the sample and study them with the transmission electron microscope. So it makes that just a little bit easier as well. Okay, so now that we have an idea of what we can do with an SEM, I would just wanna start talking about a little bit of an overview as to what it is and what it isn't. So the scanning electron microscope uh, is used to look at really any type of sample, but we are going to be talking about life science today. 
So we use a focus beam of electrons with focus in a really, really small spot size. And we'll talk about what that means and how we do it in just a, just a little bit. It's gonna scan over the image and build an image of that scan sample one point at a time. So line by line, point by point. We're building the image um, by scanning the sample and then simultaneously scanning a screen. And there's actually two subclasses of this scanning electron microscope that we'll dive into a little bit as well. We have a thermionic emission SEM or a conventional SEM, as well, to, as well as a field emission SEM or a FESEM, which is a little bit higher resolution. So this is that classic image of what that SEM looks like. So surface topography. Uh, the other main type of electron microscope is a transmission electron microscope or a TEM. So this uses a very focused beam of electrons and it transmits that beam actually through a thin, stamp, a thin sample. So as opposed to scanning just over the top, we're actually transmitting through it. So those samples need to be either sectioned into a very, very thin layer, maybe 100 nanometers or less. Or you can look at some type of sample that's naturally very um, electron transparent. Um, and then a camera detects those diffracted electrons that go through that sample for the entire field all at once. So you're getting more of that 2D ultrastructural image. And so you might be thinking, we just saw this. You're correct, we did. So the SEM is actually able to get images similar, maybe not with the exact same resolution as the TEM, um, but it does have some high resolution capabilities. So today we're gonna focus on the SEM and I just wanna touch on some differences between the scanning electron microscope and the light microscope, which some people might be a little bit more familiar with. So we are able to get very high resolution at high magnification with that electron microscope. So the typical resolution in the standard light microscope is about 200 nanometers. And in an SEM, that's about one nanometer. And what that means is that we're able to distinct, see these two very distinct objects as separate. So if you look at these B images on the bottom here, you're able to see the really fine hairs on that B on its face and on its eye. Um, whereas on the light microscope, we just don't have that level of resolution that can resolve each one of those hairs individually. And granted, different applications will, will be better for either light microscopy or electron microscopy. It really is up to the type of research that you're doing. But electron microscopy is certainly a great way to see these individual details if that's something that's important to you. Um, I also wanna point out the depth of resolution. So meaning the height of the specimen that appears in focus in the images. Um, it's about 300 times greater in the electron microscope than it is in the light microscope. So in this one single field of view, meaning in this one image, we can see the entire depth of that image. Whereas in the light microscope, it starts to get a little bit fuzzy. We only have so much depth that we're able to see at once. So this means that we're seeing a lot of topographical detail and that can give you a lot of information about that SEM sample. Another thing that we're able to do with the scanning electron micro microscope is microanalysis. So we're able to see chemical composition and see what that material is made up of. And we can do that with a special detector called an energy dispersive spectrometer or an EDS detector. So we're actually able to take that topographical detail and then overlay it with information with the EDS. So each one of those colors is assigned to a specific element. So maybe everything in yellow would be gold and everything in red is calcium and everything in blue is carbon. And you can see where that distinct material lies on that specific sample. All right. So now that I've given you a bit of an overview as to what SEM is and how we can use it for life sciences, I just wanna start diving into some of those basic operating principles of the SEM. So what does the inside look like and how does it work? Okay, so what we're looking at here is a scanning electron microscope. This top area here is the electron gun and also the column where we keep the electromagnetic lenses. So the gun is here at the top and this is where we produce our electrons. 
And then those electrons are formed and focused by the um, electromagnetic lenses here in the column. And from there, that beam of electrons is guided down into the specimen chamber where your sample is sitting on a stage directly below that lens. Um, as we scan that sample, we have a variety of detectors and detectors are all of these arms that you see off to the side. So we have detectors here and then there's some here. We even have some internal detectors that you really can't see that are inside the lens. And those detectors are responsible for collecting signal from that sample and then giving us pixels on the screen. So they're actually forming the image that we're seeing. Um, this area here is where we house the electronics and the vacuum system. So remember, we usually run the SDM at high vacuum, but we'll talk a little bit later as to why we do that and how we can get around that with certain samples. Um, we have the airlock here. So the airlock keeps the chamber under vacuum during sample exchange, and this is going to save you time and keep that gun really, really clean. So we want to make sure that we're keeping any air molecules, dust, dirt, debris out of that, um, out of the lenses and out of the column and out of the gun and keep everything running smoothly. Um, the image display here is where your image is going to be displayed as it's collected from the SEM. Uh, the control panel is then located here. So it's here at the control panel that we can adjust uh, the the orientation of the sample, we can adjust the magnification, the focus, you name it, everything can be done with a simple knob or the click of a mouse. So I'm gonna go through all of these details, but I think it's important to understand that you really don't need to have all of this insider information in order to operate the SCM. It's actually quite simple and the SCM does a lot for us, but it's really amazing to understand the inner workings and just how much is actually happening behind the scenes. So while I showed you everything here, I just want to point out that we're really going to focus on the gun, the lenses, and the detectors today. So I just want to show you a quick animation for how the SDM works, and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So this is a virtual cross-section of the column, and the electron beam is going to be colored blue here. So that electron beam is generated by the gun at the top of the column. And then those electrons are accelerated by the gun down through the column, which consists of electron optics and apertures that finally focus that beam and then direct them onto the sample that's sitting in the specimen chamber just below that final lens right there. So as that beam is scanned or rastered across the sample, we have a variety of electrons, and photons and X-ray signals that are generated here. And then these signals will be collected by detectors and converted into a digital image on the screen. So more details to follow. So now that I've given you an overview of how the SEM works, we can start to talk about some of the components and how they function to work together to create that image. So what we're looking at here, this is just simply a cartoon rendering of a cross section of the column where the electron gun and the lenses are housed. So the specimen is going to be seated here, right below that final lens within the specimen chamber on the stage. So the electrons are generated by the gun and then they're accelerated by a voltage of anywhere from 0.1 to maybe, maybe 30 kV through the electromagnetic lenses that form and focus the beam and then guide it onto the sample below. So the electron beam is then going to be rastered across the sample using scanning coils. And as it does this, we have this release of signals such as secondary and backscattered electrons. And just a little bit, we'll talk more about what secondary and backscattered electrons are and how they form that image. So then that image is formed by scanning the beam over that sample surface in that raster pattern using scan coils. And those scan coils are located right there in the last lens. And their whole job is to simply scan that beam across the sample over and over and over. So the display screen is then synchronized to the raster scan on the sample. So we scan the sample and at the same time, we're scanning that monitor. And so each point where that beam strikes the specimen 
and generates a signal such as an elect like a secondary electron or a backscattered electron. We have a corresponding pixel that's going to be going to be displayed on that monitor. So we're actually building that image up point by point, line by line, by scanning the sample and then scanning the monitor. All right, so I just wanna talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So this figure represents your display screen. And as I said, it's rastered simultaneously with the sample in the specimen chamber. And this is actually kind of similar to the scanning that we do on a confocal microscope. So this might sound just a little bit familiar. So the primary electron beam will scan a horizontal line on that specimen and that's shown in blue. And then secondary and backscattered electrons that are shown in green are gonna be generated at each one of the pixels along that line. Then the beam is gonna fly back and down to the next line and that movement is showed there in yellow. And so it's just gonna do this over and over and over, scanning across and down and across and down. And that's why we call it a raster. That's a raster pattern. So as it's um, collecting and generating these backscattered electrons, we're collecting those with detectors and forming the image. So on that note, I think it's important to point out how we magnify the image. We're not actually using our lenses to do so. We're simply changing the area that we scan on that sample. So if you look at this sample here, if you wanna see a low mag um, image, so maybe something at 10X or 100X, you're simply scanning a larger area of that sample. But if you wanna see that image more magnified, maybe at a thousand times magnified or maybe even a million times magnified, you're simply zooming in and scanning a much smaller area on the sample. So it's not lenses that are changing where we're looking, it's simply the area that we're scanning on the sample. And one thing I think that's neat to point out is that this is actually very simple to do with an SCM. We're simply turning the knob and by doing so we can increase the magnification and decrease the magnification. So it's a lot like playing with Google Earth. If you ever go on Google Earth and you can you see the, the entire country and then you zoom in and you see your state and then your city and then you look for your house. That's essentially what we can do with the SEM as well. We're just reducing that scanned area and keeping the number of pixels constant. So we really have no fixed magnification and that magnification can be randomly selected all with the turn of a knob. Okay, so now that we have those basic operating principles, we have an idea of how it works. We're gonna to start to dive into some of those components and how those components work together to form the image. So as I said, this top region is the gun and the column. So we're gonna dive into what the gun is and how it works. So this is another cross section of the electron gun in the column. As I said, the gun is located at the top and it's responsible for generating that primary beam of electrons that we are going to be used, um, using for imaging. And there are two main types of guns that I'm gonna go through in just a second. We have a thermionic emission gun and a field emission gun. So thermionic emission guns, these are used in conventional scanning electron microscopes or CSEMs. And here the electron generation is actually heat induced. So we're actually going to heat a filament tip and that filament can be composed of tungsten or a lanthanum hexaboride. So we heat that filament and we heat it just enough so that the outer orbital electrons can escape. Then we localize um, the energy, the negative energy of all of those electrons and force them down the column through a more negative aperture uh, within the well-knit cap. And so the well-knit cap is like it sounds, it's this little hat that sits right below that filament and it forces those electrons down into a little opening. And then from there, those electrons are gonna be attracted to the mo more positive charge of this anode plate. So the anode is gonna further pull those electrons through the gun and into the column where they can then be focused by the lenses. And I really wanna point out here that the voltage potential between the filament and the anode, so the difference in that voltage is known as the accelerating voltage. So this is how much 
power or speed we're giving those electrons to move from the gun through the column and onto the sample. And that's gonna come in really, really handy when we start talking a little bit more about how this works with biological samples. So now I wanna shift a little bit and talk about field emission guns. And field emission guns are used in a field emission SEM or a FESEM. So the gun is a little bit different here. Instead of using heat, we're actually um, generating electrons using an electrostatic field. And I won't go into all the details about how this works because we could talk about this for hours. But one thing I wanna point out is that by using a field emission gun, um, we actually are getting higher brightness and a lower energy spread of that beam. So what does that mean? That means that we have more electrons that are generated um, and a lot more energy. So what this does is this gives us a more highly resolved image. We have more electrons to play with here. And we're gonna talk about how this high resolution imaging all comes into play in just a few slides. So by using this uh, beam of electrons, what we wanna do is we wanna get a small spot size, meaning we take that cloud of electrons that's produced by the gun and we focus it into the smallest spot we possibly can. And what that does is it's going to give us a more highly resolved image. So if you look here at this diagram with a small spot size, the area between two features can be distinguished and the larger spot, it can't. So if you're trying to distinguish between the little hairs on this mosquito leg and your beam is too big, you're not gonna be able to resolve that image, right? You won't be able to see those hairs as two distinct pieces. But in order, in order uh, to see that, we can use a much smaller probe. So this is really how I just am trying to really point out that we really need that very small spot size. All right, so moving right along. So now that we know where the electrons come from, we can move on to the electromagnetic lenses and how they are used to form and focus that beam. So as I said, the lenses are located here in the column just before the gun there at the top. Um, and we use a series of electromagnetic lenses to form and focus that beam. Remember, you want a small spot, as small as you can possibly get. So they're gonna be used to reduce that diameter of the beam. And then in that very last lens, there's scan coils there that will take that beam and move it across the sample in that raster pattern. So the lens system consists of condenser lenses, objective lenses, apertures, and those scanning coils. So how does an electromagnetic lens work? So I wanna point out that we are not using glass lenses, we're using electromagnetic lenses. So if you're used to using a light microscope, you might be a little bit more familiar with how that glass lens works. So in this optical focusing in a light microscope, you have a glass lens and an air glass interface that causes a refraction of those light rays. And then that spherical shape of the lens leads to focusing of those light rays into a point. But in an electron microscope, we're not using light, we're using electrons and those electrons will not be controlled by the glass lens. So what we do here instead is we take this a current and we pass it through a wound copper coil. And what this does is it produces a magnetic field within that lens. And this forces those electrons closer together, giving us that really fine spot. The more we can focus those, the better. So this magnetic field is gonna bend those electron paths in a similar way that glass lenses can bend those light rays. I think it's also important to point out that in a light microscope, those glass lenses have a fixed focal length. So in order to focus that system, we are actually moving the specimen into the proper plane of focus, right? So you switch your objective, maybe you're going from a 10X to a 20X, and then you're going to move that sample up and down on the stage to get into just that right plane of focus for each objective lens. Um, but with the electron microscope, those electromagnetic lenses have a variable focus length. So that focus is simply adjusted by varying the current that's running through the lens. So more or less current is gonna change that electron trajectory and it's gonna change the focusing of that sample. So the lenses here are not physically changed. 
So again, it's important to point out that this is all done as simply as turning a knob on that sample control panel. Okay, so we've gone through some of the components of the SEM. We have an idea of how the electron gun works, how those uh, electromagnetic lenses work, and now we're gonna start to talk about what happens when that electron beam interacts with the sample. And we call this beam specimen interaction. So when that primary electron beam scans the surface of the sample, uh, do you have this um, interaction that's occurring. And that interaction is actually occurring within the sample in what we call this interaction volume. So it's this area where that beam is interacting with the atoms inside the sample and causing different signals to be produced. So this interaction volume, the size and shape of it can change depending on the sample that we're looking at and the speed of the electron beam. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So as that beam electron interacts with the specimen, you have different signals that are produced. And in order to visualize the specimen in the SEM, you're actually gonna choose one of these signals with your detector, and that will change the way that image looks like on the screen. And more about that in just a second. So some of the various signals that are collected here, there's really a wide array. So we have visible light, heat, x-rays and different types of electrons like OJ electrons, secondary electrons, and backscattered electrons. Um, and we are going to focus on secondary electrons and backscattered electrons as these are primarily used to create that visible image. So before we move on to talk about some of the various detectors that are available to collect these various signals and change the way that image looks, um, I think it's important to talk about the interaction volume just a little bit more because this is incredibly important for life science samples specifically. So this is the interaction volume within the sample and the depth and the width of this interaction volume is gonna change by several factors. So one of that is the energy of the primary beam the atomic number of the specimen, so what that specimen is made up of, and then the diameter of the primary beam. So the dimension of that interaction volume is going to decrease or get smaller with higher atomic numbered elements. So let's say you're looking at something that's made up of gold. And the reason for that is that these higher atomic numbered elements, they absorb or stop more electrons, and so they have a much smaller volume. Um, whereas if you're looking at a sample that's made up of a lower atomic number of elements, such as carbon, so let's say that this is carbon, or sorry, that this is carbon, you're going to have a much deeper penetration depth. Um, another thing that's going to change that um, interaction volume size is the dimension, um, uh, sorry, is going to be the energy of that primary beam. So the dimension of that interaction volume is going to increase or get larger with increasing accelerating voltage. So the, the more speed you give those electrons, the higher that accelerating voltage, the bigger that interaction volume is going to be. The less um, speed that you're giving that accelerating voltage, the smaller that interaction volume will be. So I like to think of this as like a, a, a train speeding towards a brick wall. The faster that train is going, the deeper into that brick wall it's gonna crash. So why, why do I bring this up? This is actually really important when we're looking at biological samples. So many biological samples are made up of these lower atomic numbered elements, right? We have a lot of carbon here, a lot of hydrogen, um, nitrogen. So we really wanna make sure that we're seeing the very surface of that sample and not actually the depths below it where you're actually getting into like the stage and the sample holder. So when you're imaging biological specimens with the SEM, using low accelerating voltages is really ideal. So this low KV is gonna give you that maximum surface sensitivity. Whereas if you're looking with higher accelerating voltages, so looking at these mouse intestinal cells at 15 KV, 
that signal is coming from a combination of the surface, but also the volume beneath the surface. So this gives you kind of that muddied look. You don't see those highly resolved structures like you can see at that lower accelerating voltage at 1 kV. So looking at this graphic here, we can see that for different accelerating voltages, the different interaction volumes result in a really different type of image that's being generated. So if you're using the SEM, I recommend adjusting that accelerating voltage and choosing the best voltage that's going to give you the most highly resolved, sensitive area of those really, really um, finite surfaces of that sample. We can really change what we're seeing a lot just by adjusting that accelerating voltage. So at those lower KVs, the images show better definition of those surface features. And at higher KVs, so maybe starting at 5 kV and above, you're starting to get that combination of the surface sample and the area below it. So keep that in mind if, you're, if you are starting to look at biological images with your SEM, we can really change this by adjusting our accelerating voltage. So given the fact that low KV imaging is so important for life science, I think it's also important to point out the importance of low KV imaging for volume studies. So you remember at the beginning, we talked about um, these different volume methods, methods, so using array tomography or serial block-based SEM or FibSEM, especially with that serial block-based SEM, it's really important that you're only seeing that surface. So I want to get your attention down here to these images. If you look at this, this is a thin section of biological material, and you can really see the power of the beam penetration for this specific serial block face image. So the images here, these are both blocks from a serial block face study. So this is a plastic block with a biological specimen that's been embedded there in the block. And on the image at the left, you can see that this uh, was um, image with a 3 kV beam and the image on the right was image with a 2 kV beam. So now I want to draw your attention to this 50 nanometer epoxy here and here. So to show the power of that electron um, beam of that accelerating voltage, we place a piece of 50 nanometer epoxy on top of that block face. So you have your sample block with the specimen embedded and then a plain piece of epoxy on the top of it. And we, when we looked at that block with a 3 kV beam, you could see right through that 50 nanometer epoxy and you're actually seeing the details below it. But when you look at it at 2 kV, you are only seeing the 50 nanometer epoxy. So why do I bring that up? The reason I'm doing that is when you're doing certain volume studies, like with this serial block face technology, you want to make sure that you're seeing that area that's being ablated. So you only want to interact with the surface and not expose that sub volume. You want to make sure you're getting an accurate representation of that block face material. So one of the challenges of generating these high resolutions at low kV is that when you're using that low kV, the electron beam has a tendency to kind of bloom out. And when it does that, you can't get this really small, bright, bright spot size. And if you can't get that really small spot, then your resolution suffers. So one thing that we can do to get around that is we use what's called the beam booster in our Gemini column. So the beam booster gets around this by essentially boosting that electron beam by an additional 8 kV as it travels down the column. So it keeps that spot size nice and small. And then it decelerates it back to your initial low kV voltage, maybe 1 kV, right as it leaves that very last lens and hits the sample. So this is really, really essential when you're doing some of these volume studies, maybe with serial block face, where you need high resolution but you also want to have that low KV. All right, so now that we have a bit of a better understanding of how that interaction volume can affect the image, especially in life science samples, um, I'd like to start talking about some of the signals that we use to produce those images. So remember, when we visualize the specimen in the SEM, we're choosing to see a picture of that specimen by collecting certain signals. So now we're going to start talking about 
those image forming signals, secondary electrons and backscattered electrons. And these are usually used for creation of your image. So secondary electrons, which are here on the left side of the screen, these are created when a beam electron co um, collides with an electron from that specimen atom and it loses substantial energy to that atom. And so what this does is it transfers energy to that specimen atom and it causes it to ionize. So we have electrons that are um, emitted as part of this ionization, and these are called um, secondary electrons. So secondary electrons are characterized as having low energy. They're 50 electron volts or less. And these are actually created throughout the entire region of that interaction volume. But because they're such low energy, they really only escape from the first few layers of that surface. So because of that, we're actually using them to see more topography because they're escaping right from that surface. So secondary electrons, surface topography. So here we're looking at gecko skin with that secondary electron image. So you're seeing all of the different pores and all of the features of that skin. Um, Backscattered electrons, however, give you more of material contrast. So it's using the, com the um, composition of the sample to provide contrast as opposed to the topography of the sample. So a backscattered electron occurs when a primary beam electron comes into really close proximity with a specimen atom or a nucleus or maybe even an outer shell electron. And then it scatters back out of the specimen and back up towards the SEM with really minimal energy loss. So that means that these are really, really high energy electrons. Um, so these are characterized as having energy greater than 50 electron volts. And so because they have more energy, they're escaping at much greater depths within that specimen interaction volume. So not just here at the surface, but all throughout. Um, and because of this, we're getting more materials contrast. So one thing I'd like to point out is it also shows us Z contrast. So what do I mean by that? So higher atomic numbered elements are actually going to be appear brighter in that backscattered image and lowered atomic numbered elements are going to appear darker. So here we're looking at gold nanoparticles and those gold nanoparticles are uh, made up of a much higher atomic number. So they're very bright. And on top, they are sitting on top of this plastic sphere, which is primarily carbon, and that appears dark. So that's where we're getting that material contrast. And I really want to point out that this is very, very important for life science imaging. So when we're starting to get into those volume studies where we're taking the really thin slices and then building that 3D rendering, whether that be for a ray tomography or serial block base or with the fib -sem, we're actually using backscattered electrons to get this high contrast signal. And you might be thinking, well, most biological samples aren't naturally that contrasted. And you're right. We actually add that contrast by doing a heavy metal stain. So we stain the sample prior to imaging um, with things like lead and osmium tetroxide and urinal acetate. And we give it this, um, this contrast that it doesn't naturally have. And then we're able to use those backscattered electron detectors to get these high contrasted images. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in is learning a little bit more about volume and learning about um, how we can prepare these special type of samples, I highly recommend that you check out our website where we have a lot more information. This talk is just an overview on all of that. All right, so now we're going to get into that signal detection. So we know what secondary electrons are. We know what backscattered electrons are. How do we use those to form our image? So detectors selectively detect the electron or the X-ray signals that are produced by that beam specimen interaction. And remember, the detectors are located on the outside of the SEM or on the inside. So they can be the arms hanging off the side, or it can actually be on axis in the column. So the presence of multiple detectors on the SEM allows us to detect multiple signals in parallel. So if you think about it, it's kind of like having this Swiss army knife, if you will. So you can look at the compositional contrast or the topography contrast or 
um, a combination of the two of them and get two, three, four, five very different renderings of how that sample looks. And each one of those provides a lot of important information, but different types of information. So you can decide what's most important for your specific type of research. So secondary electron detectors can be side mounted, so on the side or on axis, meaning in line with that column. And having them on the side gives rise to more of that topographic contrast. So it looks, it at least appears to be more in 3D. Whereas that backscattered electron detector is generally placed on that beam axis and that's gonna minimize that topographical shadowing. Okay, so now I'd just like to go through some of the common detectors that we use for life sciences. This is just a, a simple, a simple idea of a few of the many detectors that are available. So I hope this gives you an idea of what you can do, but just know that there are many more detectors out there than what I'm pointing out today. So we'll start with some of the, the detectors that we use to look at um, secondary electrons. Remember, this is that topography contrast. So the first one I wanna point out is a classic. This is on many, many SEMs used for biological sciences. And this is the Everhart Thornley Secondary Electron Detector or the ETSD. So this is a side mounted detector. So this is really excellent for overview imaging of samples with really high topography. Um, and one thing I wanna point out here is that this kind of light and shadow effect are really easily interpreted as 3D by our brains, right? You look at this and it looks like, okay, the sun is over here. I'm seeing a shadow here. This is definitely 3D here and here. But a lot of that actually has to do with the way the sample is angled towards the detector. So specimens that are angled towards the detector, like you see here, you have more secondary electrons that are detected. And so because we have more secondary electrons detected, that equals more pixels on the image, which means it's much, much brighter on our resulting image. But if you are looking at areas that are angled away from the detector, like here, these are actually um, collecting fewer secondary electrons by that detector. So because you have fewer electrons, that results in fewer pixels, which means it looks darker. So a lot of this 3D kind of shadowing has to do with the geometry of your sample towards the detector. All right, so that is secondary electron with Everhart Thornley. Another type of secondary electron detector that we have is this in-lens detector. And this is really, really amazing for uh, life science samples because it's very, very surface sensitive. So this is really important for biological samples that maybe don't have a lot of contrast. So this is located in the column right above the lens, so right here, and it detects secondary electrons directly in that beam path. Um, so this video actually shows unstained yeast cells that are being milled by that focus ion beam um, within the FIBSEM. So these are completely unstained. These are um, yeast cells that have not been heavy metal treated whatsoever. And all of that contrast is simply brought out by that sensitivity of that in-lens detector. So it can be really, really important for life science samples, especially if you have some that maybe you can't um, stain for any reason. So this is really speaking to that power of the in-lens detector. So that's just a couple of the many secondary electron detectors that are available. Um, and now I want to shift focus a little bit to backscattered electron detectors. And remember, backscattered electrons are going to give us that compositional contrast. So this type of detector is our ESD detector or an energy selective backscatter detector. So this is an in-column um, ESD, detector, ESD detector. So it's actually located in the column right above the in-lens detector. Um, so in order to prevent detection of secondary electrons, it actually has a filtering grid that's installed right in front of that ESD detector. So by switching that filtering grid on, secondary electrons are rejected and only backscattered electrons are detected. So this is giving us that really pure collection of backscattered electrons and really speaks to that high contrast, something that's especially important when you're looking at these heavy metal stained thin sections. 
So at low accelerating voltages, maybe below 1.5 kV, which we're routinely using for these life science samples, the filtering grid has this additional function, function of selecting um, only certain energy backscattered electrons. So this means that you can enhance that section imaging by adjusting the energy of the backscattered electrons you collect. So by collecting higher energy backscattered electrons as opposed to lower energy backscattered electrons, the theory there is that those higher energy electrons are coming from the surface, giving you even more surface detail than those lower energy backscattered electrons, which might be giving you a little bit more detail about that subsurface. So there's a lot of different ways that we can really highlight that uh, life science image. Another backscatter detector that's available for this is our annular backscatter detector or ABSD. So this one is not located on the axis. This one is actually an in-chamber pneumatic detector. So um, we insert it into the chamber when we wanna use it and then we can take it back out when we're not using it. So this is a solid state detector. So backscattered electrons actually exit the specimen and they're going to strike this six segment sil circular silicon diode, say that five times fast. Um, and by hitting it, it causes this ejection of electrons in the silicone. And this generates a flow of electrons that's proportional to the number of backscattered electrons that strike it. So what that means is that the more backscattered electrons that strike that, that area, the bigger that signal is gonna be. And then that current is then amplified and the signal is sent to your display monitor. So you can see what that image looks like. So I, one thing that's really, really neat about this annular backscatter detector is that these different segments can be turned on and off to change that image contrast. So this inner ring can be switched on to give us more compositional contrast. The middle ring shown here gives us more of that mixture of the top topographical contrast and the compositional. And then the outer ring gives us more of the topographical details alone. So a really a wide variety of ways that you can look at that sample just with one single detector. So another type of backscattered electron detector here, and this is the last one I'll talk about, is the sense BSD. So this really gives us this PEM-like image with our SEM. So EM technology is really advanced in such a way that getting these type of images has become possible with the SEM alone. So the sense BSC to detector is an example of one of those advancements. So it's specially designed for imaging ultrastructure because it has a new type of diode that's extremely sensitive. Um, so we can detect very small numbers of backscattered electrons and then convert those signals into a high contrast image. So this is really, really speaks to the importance of life science samples that might not have as much of that, that um, backscattered electron signal. We don't need as much and we can still get that really high resolution image. Very, very, very sensitive. So one thing that we haven't talked about is the uh, transmitted electrons. So we can look at transmitted electrons with a STEM detector and that's short for scanning transmission electron microscope. So this is a detector that's mounted on the underside of the specimen for perpendicular to that optical axis. And this is used to collect electrons that have enough energy to pass through the specimen. Um, and these are called transmitted electrons. So we would look at samples that have, that have been sectioned with an ultramicrotome and placed on a PEM grid, or you can look at samples that are just naturally thin or electron transparent. Um, and then that grid is placed onto this special PEM grid holder that's been adapted for the SEM stage. Um, one thing that's really great about this is that it holds 12 TEM grids at a time. So you don't have to take that sample in and out and in and out every time you want to change it. You can simply rotate that holder and see a different sample. So this functions really similarly to a solid state BSD detector, meaning that you can turn certain segments on and off in order to enhance or change that image contrast, which is what you're seeing in this image here. So I know we're getting to the end, so I just wanna wrap up with um, some really cool things that we can do with the vacuum. So typically the SCM is operated at high vacuum 
Um, and we do this to allow passage of the electron beam without it being um, interrupted by um, interfering air molecules. So this is really wonderful for conductive samples, um, but for many samples like biological samples, um, this can cause a lot of charging on the samples because they're not naturally conductive and delicate samples can collapse under this high vacuum environment. So this is charging here. This is when those electrons are not connected to the ground. They have nowhere to go and they stick to the specimen surface and it causes a lot of issues with your imaging. Um, so you have a lot of image deformation and shifting and the brightness is crazy. So charging can be a real issue. So variable pressure SEM or VPSEM has emerged as a way uh, to deal with this charging. So essentially what it does is we are leaking air, nitrogen, or water vapor into that sample chamber and affecting that sample pressure. And so then that static charging on the sample is neutralized by the ionized gas or air molecules. So we're able to get rid of the charging and see samples naturally without having to add any kind of conductive layer. Another way that we're able to do this is what is with what is called focal charge compensation or FCC. So samples uh, specifically for serial block face where you have a lot of empty resin or a lot of open areas, uh, maybe in like a lung tissue, these are really prone to charging um, specifically when they're low contrast. So this is like having that variable pressure but instead of affecting the entire area of that sample chamber, it's directed just onto the sample itself. So we use a little needle that is going to direct that nitrogen gas only onto the sample surface. So we can cut away, get our image, cut away, get our image, and just have that little bit of nitrogen right there on the top to reduce that charging. All right, so now we're gonna wrap it up. I know we're getting right to the end. Um, I really hope that this talk has showed you that there really are so many different ways that you can view your biological samples in the SEM. Um, and also that that SEM can really be tailored to your unique research needs. We have a variety of detectors and we can truly design the SEM based on what your lab might be doing, what your core is doing or what your individual needs are. No two SEMs are really the same, I truly believe that. Um, and that many functions of the SEM are actually automated or done with a click of a button. So you really don't need to understand all of the inner workings to be able to use it. So I hope you enjoyed the talk today. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more or even uh, looking at a guide that will take you through this talk, um, please visit our website and you can do so by accessing the QR code here. Thank you all so much for listening in. I really appreciate your time.